Wheatley and welcome to episode 166 of the Weekly Weekly Podcast. Uh, thank you very much for joining us as always, wherever you're doing. So um, I want to say thanks to Sophie for coming on last week to talk about um, the benefits of a sober life. And, you know, um, it's something that I've been doing for, for a, a lot of years now. And uh, Sophie was uh, much better at explaining uh, than I was at, at any of it, really. But someone who is so... Um, enthusiastic about it and who could explain like how she's spoken to other people um about it uh so if you want to go back and listen to that do um you can find her on instagram at sober and happy um it's worth checking out uh today i'm going to mess up this uh introduction yeah <laughs> so um because i bet i we talked about this uh and i apologize to louise in advance but i'm going to say uh somebody who helps in grief support and is a pet loss specialist Louise Griffey, how are you doing, Louise? Hey, how are you, Derek? Perfect introduction. <laughs> I don't know. I do you know what I do sometimes? I, I I have it written out like we talked before we start recording, and what happens then is I get cocky and I don't write down what the change was, and then when I look at it, I panic a little bit. But look, we'll get into what you do anyway, so it's not too important for that. But Louise, we always start in the same place. Could you give us a short history of your upbringing, please? Yeah, no problem. So. I am originally from County Clare, just outside the town of Ennis, and I grew up on a farm. So my dad was farming cattle, so it was very outdoorsy kind of life, um, not much indoors. <laughs> so I'm the oldest of two. I have two younger brothers, um, 35 I am, and I just grew up like loving animals and, you know, always loving ponies and horses and we didn't have any for a long time but uh, my dad worked hard and eventually was able to buy me my first pony so I was delighted with that so I spent all of my childhood out with my pony and you know just absolutely obsessed with horses Um, so that that was just a lot of my childhood yeah and I went on to study business studies in equine in Athlone IT actually so I did uh, my degree there um, and just went traveling and lived in a couple of different countries, working with horses and then working in offices. So a mixture of business and animals kind of kept it like that. And uh, here I am today now working, um, still working with, you know, animals in in somewhat of a way, but also, you know, working with grief and loss and helping people through pet loss. So, yeah. Um, I've talked to like uh, a number of people who kind of grew up in, on farms and stuff. And it's always like, um, I guess the idea or, you know, that we had when we, when I was a kid, I didn't grow up on a farm or anything, but, uh, it was always like that idyllic kind of life outside. And it wasn't so much for me about like, I, I suppose like the animals didn't really come into play in my mind. It was just the idea of just being out in the open and like I've spoken on the podcast about this before, I am in, on a farm now and it's great. Like I, I can understand it a bit more and I can kind of understand. I um, don't know how many times I can bring up cow cows in a podcast, but I've done it uh, so many times. But I just find them very soothing animals, just very Fair relaxing. Beauty. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, that kind of thing of just looking out the window and there's the slowness of the movement or something. I just... I've got this really like kind of I wouldn't say fascination, but I've, I love cows now since I moved out into the country, <laughs> as weird as that might sound. Um, but then so the next question we always ask Louise is like, when did you first become aware of mental health? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I think if I'm to think it's probably would have been my own mental health mm-hmm. was when I first became aware of it. I suppose I was the I was around 14 or 15 and I was brutally kind of bullied in secondary school um inside and outside of school and which god I you know I sympathize with the young people nowadays that there's social media and everything and phones and back then you know there wasn't that so it was like well there was phones but I mean there wasn't like any kind of signal yeah yeah Yeah. so I mean like I I just struggled it's 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 just a struggle when you're in school and you try to communicate it with the with, you know with the teachers and I, I I spoke to my parents about it at the time and you know they tried to get help but unfortunately the school you know they couldn't help so you know it was five full years of of kind of dreadful bullying and 
be you know being diagnosed with depression and self-harm you know around that time as well thank god my parents got me into therapy you know at that age so I was you know I was I really it really did help because it was just heartbreaking for me because I didn't know how to deal with this and friends at the time it was kind of taboo you know mm -hmm. I couldn't really speak to any of my friends at the time so it was great that I had you know a therapist that I could just open up to and and I I got better you know what I mean I got better and it took a good few years but that was my first experience of it and it was quite intense because I almost said I don't know why I'm you know feeling like this and I'm being bullied but like is lots of people are bullied and why why do they you know why are they okay well maybe they're not so you know that's the thing you know maybe they are suppressing the feelings and kind of not getting the opportunity to kind of have therapy and so on so yeah that was my first experience of it. I think what you know what you did was great it was talk to your parents about it I, I, you know and you're saying about taboo and I think it's I'm not sure, obviously, because I'm not in that environment now, you know, but when, when we are growing up and we think that something is taboo and we shouldn't discuss this for our parents, somehow it's we're we're weak, you know, and as if this is bullying and these kids that are bullying are like, it'll be an extension onto your parents then as if like, why is my kid? That's what we're thinking. And we over, I guess, even for 15 year olds, the way we think like we overanalyze everything anyway, we do now. But like when we're kids, we definitely do. And. I always think of it as like this, the, one of the most like lonely things really is to be picked on, be bullied because we do feel like everything they're saying is true. So, well then I, like, who am I going to talk to my parents or my, you know, my friends or anything? I can't say anything. And I, it just, it's one of those things that I think of now as I was, you know, got older and I started talking about mental health when it started happening to me, even then I was thinking like, this is, I'm weak now. Like, you know what, what, I can't deal with my everyday existence like the next person. And it's the same thing that happens because you think, well, I'm not going to tell anyone and you go down that kind of path. So for you to tell your parents and then to, you know, get a therapist um, and, and to get better because of that, like, it's amazing. And if we can, like I, I like to think it's better, but I'm sure, like you said, with the social media and all the stuff that's happening now, like it's, it's, it's pretty grim. You, you know, you I see it. It's, yeah, it's worse. It's, I, I can't even imagine how, how pe how young people are coping with it nowadays. Mm. You know, considering I had it's such such an impact on me back then that it was like, how do they even cope? Like it's uh, that's a no whole another podcast probably f topic for yourself. But yeah, you know yeah. that's it's it's unimaginable really but yeah and that's the key that's the thing like I got I spoke to my parents but that was kind of like a long lead up of, of yeah. you know I don't want to go to school why you know the question mm. of why 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 and would just blurt out eventually but it was months of you know holding it in but that's the thing like you know I suppose for fear that they might have said oh toughen up you know get on with it yeah. What I said, I was at a breaking point where it was like it has to, it had to be verbalized, and that was just, that was just it. I didn't have to like take the consequences if there were any, but luckily they were supportive. So yeah, yeah, and that like it is. I know what you say, what you're saying. Like it is in a whole other podcast, but we have. It's it's sad to say the amount of times it's come up. You know that the, the first experience the people have of of mental health with this question that I always ask is is a lot of it is in school through bullying and and, and things like that and anxiety mm -hmm. that it creates. So yeah, it's it's it. Look, I suppose yeah, like you say, it's another subject, but it just keeps coming up. And uh, so hopefully people are are listening and making sure keeping an eye on their kids and stuff like that, and making sure that you know people are are, are on top of it. Um, so. I'm going to ask the, the big question and I'm not going to get the wording right in this. So what is an advanced grief recovery method specialist? <laughs> it's a fancy term for <laughs> myself. I, I I work and help people to process major loss experiences in their life. So that's, that is the crux of it, the explanation of it. And it, it works it's different to therapy. It's more of an educational based program, but it has huge therapeutic benefits. So, you know, I trained and was fully certified by the Grief Recovery Institute, which is a US based company. So 
it was all live trainings over Zoom and everything else, um, months, uh, months and months of training. But it was absolutely amazing. Like it was it, like nothing I had ever tried before. And I suppose for context as to how I got in or found, you know, the grief recovery kind of training was in 2019, both of my dogs, you know, died within a short space of time of each other. And I found myself completely alone. But prior to, to their deaths, four weeks prior to that, my six year relationship ended. So I was living alone in a completely empty house where it was full of life, you know, beforehand. And I was finding life really difficult. I was finding that my purpose was kind of gone. And I kind of, I was searching for help, I guess, because I was struggling. So, but I kind of wanted, you know, maybe specific kind of help that I was like, you know, maybe someone help me with this pet loss grief. There, surely there's someone in Ireland and I couldn't find anybody. And I kind of thought, <clears throat> I kind of thought, well, maybe I'll have to search further afield or, you know, I gave up for a while. And then I didn't when I was deep in grief. So as you can imagine, concentration levels were coming and going and you know I suffered with panic attacks and post-traumatic stress after after they died and everything else so eventually I just stumbled across that the website the grief recovery website I said well what's this and I looked into it and I said well I kind of said to myself well if there is no one that I could find in Ireland that can help people with pet loss I'd love to be able to help people mm -hmm. with pet loss so I ended up contacting them and chatting with them and seeing like they agreed that I it would be you know a good thing to do some training but that you know before you do training you do the whole program yourself so I work on my own losses yeah so it was incredible I got to work on both of my dogs deaths and you know even losses human losses in my life and whether whether those people are dead or alive loss is not just about death as mm -hmm. we know it's job loss career loss health loss you know estrangement from family members breakups the list there's over 40 different kinds of losses the list goes on and on I could be here all night but like when I did the program I felt better right and that's that's what I wanted because people that are grieving want to feel better and we think we have to live with this pain all the time and I do get emotional talking about it because it, it had such an impact on me because I was just desperate. I was desperate to feel better from this grief that I was feeling from these traumatic things that happened. And I did. And like, I can't even explain, you know, the benefits that I received from it. But that's how I found the program and why I decided to train I became fully trained after I worked on a lot of my own losses um and I have I've helped you know people deal with different kind of losses human and pet and you know my hope is to to spread awareness about it and, and keep on trying to help people so that's sorry that was a bit long-winded there but... no it, not at all because it, it it obviously describes how you get into it but obviously you know the, your reasons for it and I I you know the Americans can be kind of an easy target sometimes. You know, and and like what well, and look, everybody can be to be fair. But we, I've spoken to a number of people about how the Americans are so far ahead of us in certain aspects. And like you just said there about you know looking around for someone to help you with your with your loss and your and your grief, and nobody here at all. Like, uh, and the Americans have obviously have a, a you know something already set up in advance, and it's you know brilliant that there's somebody doing it because you could have been searching around forever you know and that like yeah. it's you know seeing you obviously like you said you get a bit emotional about it which is you know understandable of course with what what you were what you were going through at the time um what i i was i was telling you before we pressed record right about uh, a stupid question that i'd come up with no i felt it was stupid and then i was swimming and i was like is it stupid and i was like i don't think it is stupid but is there a wrong way to grieve no. So see, I like, I was kind of ex expecting that answer, but I was hoping for yes. And I only that that sounds bad, doesn't it? But when I was going through it in my head, it's like listing things. You know, I love making an old list, and even if it's when I'm in the middle of a swim or something. But it's it's that idea of um, I was thinking, 
so to put my history there, like I said to you, I haven't, sp- I had four goldfish when I was young, when I was a teenager. Beavis and Butthead were the first two. And then well, they were very famous at the time. And then uh, Wright and Vieira, who were two Arsenal players. OK, so I was I was in my mid-teens. And look, I don't remember much about the, the goldfish. And that that's all I had, right? OK, so, but I, if, if, you're, if you're talking about something like grief, I, my grandmother passed away like a few years ago. And I remember I told this story before, but I remember going in, um, to the, the funeral and then after the funeral, like I've a lot of anxiety. So I, I went upstairs and I said, right, I'm just going to sit it out up here while everybody's coming in. And while I was sitting up there, I thought like the reason I'm up here is because just anxiety, you know. But I realized then after about two or three years was a lot of the reason I was sitting up there was because I felt that if I was downstairs, people that I didn't know were going to come up to me and say, oh, I knew your grandmother, oh, we met here, or she was like this. And I wanted to protect my idea of her. I didn't, like, if my brothers talked to me about it, it's fine. But outside of the family, I didn't want it. And it was something I didn't quite, like I said, didn't quite process for two or three years. So my way of 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 grieving in that day, I guess, in that in, in a very kind of emotional day was to just remove myself from the situation, sit there, listen to some music, and just, like, you know, not be... A lot of times you hear people say, for instance, and I'm sure you've heard this many times, um, someone is feeling guilty, you know, after the loss of someone, even for something like, you know, they didn't cry at, a, at the funeral. That I, you know, you hear that quite a bit. Um, or do you hear that quite a bit? There is a lot of, a, a lot of people would talk about the guilt over I should have, or I would have, mm. and things they should have done different, better or more. And that that that's the case for human loss and our pet loss you know so often I try to ask like with the term guilt when we actually break that down you know the word guilt is in the description you know in the dictionary is 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 like intent to harm so did you intend to harm that person or that pet and they're like well no I didn't I was like well maybe maybe to reframe the word as regret maybe there's just some things that you regret Um, And that tends to really help people to kind of let go and release a bit of that feeling of guilt that they feel, because when when you reframe it and say and describe the word guilt for what it actually means, that it takes away of, you know, I didn't intend to harm that person or I didn't intend to, you know, to do that to that person or, you know, if it's I'm guilty over I didn't say this or I didn't say that and I'm guilty that I wasn't there when my pet passed away or so on. But what I like to do is just to say, well, I regret not being there. I regret not saying this. And that that tends to help a lot of people as well. Yeah, the, there's like we all know how unpredictable, like, you know, someone passing away is or, or a pet passing away is. But then on the other hand, we're always thinking, well, if I had done this, it wouldn't have happened. Or if I, you know, and, and it's, we we kind of contradict ourselves in a lot of uh, a lot of things like that, and we're kind of it's 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 a cycle in your mm. in your head, and it's the narrative and it's the storytelling of of what happened. Like for example, when my dogs passed away, the the narrative of the events of that day or those three few days was around and around and around in my head. I could have done this, I should have done that, and so on. And I kind of what, what the difference is between. I tried therapy before I found this program and I found myself just rehashing the, the, mm. the events of the, of the painful you know, few days and everything else. And I just felt like I was searching for something that could make me feel better, just something more specific. I didn't even know what that was, Derek. Like I had no idea. I was just like, I just feel like I need something else to, to help me. And with the grief recovery work that I do is... Yes, people can can say, you know, the events and the story of the loss, but we focus on the feelings. We focus on the emotions and the trapped and the suppressed, unresolved grief. So, yes, the story is important, but we've told ourselves this story over and over and over again. And maybe other people and we know we, we all know what happened or, uh, you know, mm-hmm. from the extent of what we know what happened, you know, but we never ever speak about the emotions or the feelings attached to the details or the circumstances surrounding the death. 
or the run up to the death. So that's what we really get into to release those emotions and talk about them in like a set of, you know, there's practical action steps that, that we do that throughout. But there's programs that are six weeks to eight weeks. So within a set time frame. So that's kind of what it is. It, it, it's interesting how you talk about like how you mentioned therapy and I've, I've, I've definitely experienced the idea of um, just rehashing, you know, instances, instances and events and, you know, yeah. past um, memories and stuff and uh, how instead of just relaying the stuff, we're going to deal with the stuff. And I remember going to CBT uh, and, and that was the, the the kind of breakthrough for me, you know, that idea of like, this is, we're going to challenge it. We're going to like do some homework and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that's what would interest me with regards to what you're talking about, you know, the mm-hmm. actual, because it's great. It, look, it's great sitting down chatting to someone and, you know, it does help to sit and talk it out. But if I, I feel if you're not, if you're not a pro, like if there's not a goal ahead and you're not trying to, advanced to it i think you're just going to recycle the same stuff until we're kind of probably sitting with the same feelings five years down the line you know yeah maybe numbness kind of sets yeah. in and you just kind of become like that happened to me but you really want to be in a place where but how can i actually recover from this because the word grief and recovery are alien you know to a lot of people and they don't get said together very often and you know, there is this kind of taboo in society that if, you know, you have a major loss event in your life that you have to live with that grief and it never leaves you. But that's, it's just an absolute myth. Like that's not, that is not factual information because I have recovered. I have recovered. And just because, you know, some people say that, you know, people still feel sad. Like I, I will feel sad about my dogs and the anniversary. But the thing is, the intensity of the emotions and the intensity of the pain I was feeling is not there. I can feel sad, but I can then experience joy again quite quickly. So that's the difference. The difference of me sitting at home, you know, having PTSD symptoms and panic attacks compared to now, I can still feel sad on the anniversaries or certain special dates, but I'm not, you know, bombarded with these you know, physical symptoms of grief that I was before. So. When you were um, growing up, I've seen a farm around a lot of animals and stuff like that. Um, Like your first pet or, or maybe not your first, but your first pet that passed when you were old enough to realize kind of at least realize that the dog wasn't around anymore. Yeah. A lot of the time people talk about um, it's gone to the, the dog has gone to the farm. And I, I'm sure it was mentioned in our family before with our uh, my grandfather's dog, Paddy. I, I have this idea, but I might have created the idea. You know, when you have something in your mind and you, I might have created it from a film and placed it in my own life. <laughs> um, did you have any of those experiences of, the, the you know, the, the pets going to the farm, even though you're on a farm? So maybe it doesn't work. Yeah, you, yeah that's the thing, you see, because when I... When I questioned, why am I grieving? I grew up on a farm. I saw, you know, animals dying, Mm -hmm. you know, be that cattle or be that, you know, we had lots of family dogs down through the years and cats and kittens. And um, my pony died, you know, when I was 19 and I didn't, I didn't have these symptoms. I was like, I kept questioning why, why, why? But I think it, it was, it was normal. Like, I don't think... And it was like, sometimes it was like you had time to prepare for the death. Or if there was an animal sick, my dad would be saying, you know, it's a possibility now that this animal is going to pass away if they're sick. You know, as in you had, there was honesty and and there was no like sugar coating it. They're yeah. gone off to the rainbow, whatever, in the sky or, you know, this kind of stuff. It's It was plain and simple. But I think with this time around, I had created really strong bonds and connections with these two dogs that I lived with 24 seven for many years. So it was like on a different level to kind of farm animals and stuff. So I think, and the fact that there was kind of trauma involved that I think that probably, you know, was a completely different um, type of grief to what I had maybe experienced as a child with with family pets and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh... So many people could could like 
empathize with you with you know the loss of a pet i think you know a lot of um i'm not going to just say dog owners because then the cat owners would be livid but you know i think i would hear more from people who have dogs i my um landlady i share a house with my landlady and she's got two dogs down there but her last dog passed away a few years ago now but like it was quite sick i, I it was kind of a mystery illness that kind of the dog had and dog passed away and i remember I remember being her being so upset about it, you know, and I couldn't quite, um, uh, you know, obviously I was sympathizing with her. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not a monster, but I, but I, I, I couldn't quite get the idea of it. And it's like, it's just cause I haven't had a dog or, or a, or a catch you know, or anything that wasn't living in water for a short period of time. But I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand that. And I was talking to someone recently when um, I told them you were coming on. And they were talking about their own dogs and how they would, um, they like would don't even want to talk about the idea of them not being around. You know, the idea alone is something that's terrifying. And again, it's just a, it's just a mindset that I'm I haven't experienced, so I can't quite get into it. You know, of course, and of course, and there's many you know people that haven't experienced, and mm-hmm. it's it's all, it's just about having experienced a connection with with an animal that you've lived yeah. with. You know, it's not. You know, it's not that you 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 do empathize and everything, and you are compassionate. It's just, I suppose, yeah. If, if you had that same connection with that same dog in the house, you know, you maybe you would feel similar, or you know, you would know the familiar feeling of grief. But there are lots of people that, you know, either choose not to have children or cannot, and yeah. they're they're animals. They're cats, dogs, horses. You know, rabbits. They, those are their essentially their kids so you could imagine that you know they they bring them everywhere with them so they have these really really strong bonds like with them so yeah. obviously it's it would affect their life in a huge way when they do you know die yeah that you know i often think of you know older people maybe living alone who has a who have, have a dog or you know, um, I suppose in America, it's more of a thing to have kind of the service dog and stuff like that and, and to rely so heavily on the companionship of the dog and guide dogs and everything. I mean, this goes, it, this is, maybe a, maybe it's just because I appreciate dogs more than cats. I don't know. It's just because they, they do so much more, I think. But but the idea of, of like, even the way you were speaking about it, like obviously at the time, two dogs and especially two passing within a short you know time of each other, it's, I can only imagine how devastating something like that is. Um, but for you to go from that to go to want to help other people, like there's, t- you know, it takes a special kind of person to kind of, rev- uh, you know, take that a kind of emotion and and want to go on and help other people. Uh, like how I hate asking this in, in question in this way, but how rewarding is is the work? It's it's extremely rewarding because. You see, it's giving a voice for somebody who feels like their grief isn't accepted in society, that it's a discounted, you know, unimportant kind of grief. That's that's kind of how what a lot of people say to me. And it's kind of like, you know, grief in itself, human loss. Yes, there's, you know, people struggle with communicating about that. But when it comes to pet loss, you know, some people are nearly seen as weak you know get back to work and you know don't you know don't take any time off and that kind of thing so it's like and even pet loss is kind of not just about death like dogs can disappear dogs can be stolen dogs may need to be surrendered cats you know horses it doesn't matter what kind of animal but like that's why I'm like try to be as inclusive to help many different kinds of people that are going through different kinds of loss with their animal companions. So are people like um you discussed like how you couldn't find anyone around here. Are, are people surprised when you tell them what you do that there is this you but you know that there is this kind of service available in Ireland. Yeah, they you know, you get mixed reactions, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. They're like what the hell is that like as in sure why why would that be needed and you know yeah. And then other people you meet will be like, oh, my God, finally, there's somebody that that is offering support. And so it's very mixed. That's that is the general gist of it. There's definitely kind of 50 50 views on it. 
when you uh, you talked a bit about like the courses that you you offer, like you know, six weeks or eight weeks, and um, you know, I don't want you to get too, you know, you don't have to explain the whole thing, but like the kind of, I guess, the kind of plan that you kind of look to get moving when someone does contact you. Yeah, so generally, like we, we'll, I try my best to have like a fifteen minute Zoom call, you know, so we can talk face to face, and you know, all the programs I offer are done online, so everyone can just be in the comfort of their own home. Because when people are in the depths of grief, you know, some common responses are like a huge lack of concentration, sleep disturbance, you know, trouble, you know, eating habits change, and a sense of numbness and you know, these are the things that these people are up against. So it, being able to provide it through Zoom is just so much better than, you know, having to drag people to a certain location to have a session. So basically, to kind of to kind of lay it out in simple terms for during the certain amount of weeks that somebody will sign up to a program it we we will work on a lot of educational stuff first so you know getting into what actually is grief and the myths around grief and then what ways people kind of relieve their grief in certain ways um healthy ways and unhealthy ways and things like that um and then you know we kind of get into talking about their loss events that they've had in their life and then they will try to, you know, process one major loss within the program that they of their choosing. So it's a lot of kind of I like to kind of say it's it's a jigsaw puzzle at the end, and each week is a piece of the jigsaw puzzle that you're putting together. So it's a step by step program. It's action based. It can be done within a group online or a one to one, whichever people are comfortable with within the group people pair up and they really make a connection with the person in their group and I find that they you know tell people things that they've never felt comfortable telling people before and just create this great bond and it's a safe place because it's completely confidential so they know that this won't go anywhere you know and yeah. whatever they want to disclose so you know by the end of it they do kind of say you're right about the jigsaw puzzle like yeah. it's literally you know a piece of the puzzle each week and then there's a complete puzzle. so like you say earlier there's kind of a goal to yeah. it and you kind of don't feel like you're still stuck in that unresolved grief spiral you know of the storytelling and the symptoms but the symptoms will just decrease as the weeks go on that's my experience but like yeah, that's kind of the best way I hope I've explained that. No, absolutely. Yeah. I think like even the idea of, you know, talking or even explaining, you know, what grief actually is, because it's one of, like we were talking about earlier on, but this this thing of, it's one of those words that we kind of tend to shy away from. If if somebody brings up the idea of grief, well, that's, that's too heavy a subject for us to talk about in, in open conversation. So we won't say anything, you know, we'll move on to the next thing. And that unfortunately kind of gives up or gives away the chance of us to the chance that we might have to learn about it, to kind of discuss, like I mentioned about, you know, is there a wrong way to grieve and things like that? But like you said, there's unhealthy choices that are probably easier to make, you know, like to maybe start, you know, uh, drinking too much or whatever it might be going out in the town all the time just to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, put on the blinkers and get through it. But that obviously throws away the idea that there isn't a healthy way to approach it. Um, obviously contacting you is one way, but there's, you know, there's a number of ways that there is, you know, healthy ways to approach grief. But of course we're not really learning about them because we are shy away from the idea. Mm. But like you perfectly summed up earlier on, especially in Ireland, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, let's, you know, we have to, we have to hold this grief within us, but not talk about it, which is ridiculous. Yeah. And completely. And it's like, it's like in Ireland and obviously this happens elsewhere as well, but like, it's kind of like, I'm going to be strong and I'm going to be strong for the family or be strong for the kids. And I'm going to hold, and that's a myth of grief that the be strong for myself and others. And it's like, I'm going to hold this inside. 
And eventually, when over the years or however long we're holding this grief and not processing it or speaking about it or looking at it, you know, it's going to come out physically. Yeah. And, you know, illness or mental health, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, for example, when I went through that with my dogs, I, when I wasn't, you know, processing and dealing with the grief, what I was doing to relieve the grief symptoms was I would just not want to be in my house on my own. So I would walk 10 kilometers every night after work so that I would just go to sleep. Mm. So I was like excessively exercising so that I did not want to be alone with my thoughts. So this was my way of dealing with the grief, which most people might think, oh, that's great. You're healthy and everything. But you know what? Like I wasn't. Yeah, I was I was sick and, you know, I wasn't dealing with it. So you kind of think that when we're talking about grief, it's like it's the normal and natural reaction to, you know, any kind of change or loss. Like it's the conflicting feelings caused by the end or change of a familiar situation that we were always in before. You know, that's the easiest way to kind of describe it because it's not just about death. It's about a change of a situation or something familiar patterns that we were in all along in our life and it completely turns us upside down because our lives have completely changed as to what they were before so yeah I think that's the best way to yeah and it does like we've all been touched by it in some way which is kind of the weird thing about avoiding talking about it you know it's like you can understand certain things we talked about bullying as something that was like taboo to talk about our our mental health still a little bit but you know 20 years ago a lot more uh taboo to talk about um and then we've somehow managed to get something that we've all you know maybe felt in our lives and we've somehow turned that into a taboo subject as well which is very interesting um when it comes to pet loss for instance um if someone you know you'll hear someone well i've heard someone recently say about like you know, when their dog passes and the, the, something they worry about, they want to talk about and stuff, but um, they'll never get another dog. And, you know, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that as if it were some sort of like it would be a, you know, I guess they feel guilty about, you know, bringing another dog into the house after some dog passes as if it's some idea of replacing. Have mm-hmm. you kind of heard that from from people before? Huge. Yeah. yeah like Replacing the loss is yeah. huge and in, in Ireland as well. And obviously, like when it happened to me, you know, somebody I know said to me, actually, you can just get a new puppy. Mm. But I mean, see, that's just, it's, that person meant well. I mean, I'm yeah. not saying that they didn't, but it's just, it's in like a knee jerk reaction for, for people to say that. But if if your grandmother passed away, you're not going to say, well, sure, you can get a new grandmother. Do you no. know what I mean? <laughs> no. As in, when you think of it that way, yeah, like you can compare like comparing losses isn't helpful yeah. and you know unhelpful comments like that like you can get a new puppy isn't isn't helpful to the person because it diminishes the grief that that person is feeling you know yeah. what I mean it yeah. kind of diminishes it even though this person means well but actually this person you know maybe that person might have listened to the advice and gone gone and got a new dog or a cat or you know whatever animal and then realized oh my god what am I doing you know I'm not over or I'm not yeah. you know I'm still in the depths of grief and I, I can't connect with this new animal you know I keep comparing this animal to my previous animal so I feel like I can't love it the same or give it enough of what it needs do you know what I mean so that's where it can be harmful if somebody takes on board those kinds of comments which can be really yeah. hurtful like I think that's interesting because like if I was looking at it from another way like I mentioned Anne my my landlady like when her dog passed it, it wasn't that long before she brought two more dogs in but like her her what she spoke about afterwards was to do with the companionship rather than the, the well, you know, the idea of replacing a dog. Cause that's not what she was doing. I know that now, but um, in my mind, again, not knowing anything about, you know, feeling that way about a, a pet was thinking that's a bit soon. But then I was kind of like afterwards, I like, think of it now and kind of going soon for what? Like, I don't, yeah. I didn't quite, 
like what what was I talking about basically I don't know but I was you know in the house thinking like oh that's very quick to get a couple more dogs in but for her it was like the perfect time because Mm -hmm. that was her way of you know retaining a certain kind of companionship in the house um and having those two dogs and obviously she's loved so I just have you ever felt have you ever heard anyone feel guilty for doing that though because I I wonder is that a, a thing as well well I suppose they might some people might say that you know are they kind of not honoring the memory of their original animal and and you know there there is no timeline for how yeah. long you're supposed to grieve and everybody that grieves it's unique to them their own way and it like they grieve 100 percent their own way and there's no set timelines and there's no certain way you should grieve or you know you know certain stages and this kind of stuff that that we hear of all the time and it's just unique to that person and all i would say is if that if if that person feels like they're ready to bring a new animal into, into their life then of course do. But if they have a feeling of, you know, they're still thinking about and kind of ruminating and the pain and and the upset is still with them, maybe just to not give it time because that is another myth of grief. If you give it enough time, you will be fine. But that's not because it's what you do within that time is, yeah. is how it helps. So the actions you take. So maybe the, maybe some people feel like talking to family and friends, somebody that they trust and feel safe with enough about their grief will help them to heal and recover. Or if somebody is really, really struggling with really intense feelings and grief, talking to, you know, a grief specialist is going to help them to get to eventually get to a place where they can bring a new animal into their life. So, yeah, there's no set timelines at all. Yeah, like I had a... Because you mentioned something like there's so many different types of loss, you know, and it's not just about someone passing dog. Or, I keep saying dog. I'm sorry to all the other animals, but right. The animals passing, you know, people passing, but, you know, even breakups and things like that. Um, We had a, a breakup coach on that was so long ago now, but um, I never thought of it as a, a process like and, you know, like we've all been broken up with. Well, well, some lucky people may not have, but you know, yeah. I have been broken up with. But that that um, you know, I never thought of it as uh, as a process. I thought of it as a um, like you mentioned there. That's what got me thinking of it. The idea of just well, give it a bit of time and it'll just go away. And it's it's the the idea of and it makes sense when so it's it doesn't make sense. But like when someone says it to you, you're like, oh yeah, surely that's the right thing to do. So as the the you know the months go by, it'll just ease, ease, ease until it goes away, and you'll never, you know what I mean. And it's a it's a bizarre uh, way of bizarre. looking. But yeah, but it's a very simplistic. As you know, I can see why people say it. I wouldn't say it now. Yeah. I might have said it when I was younger. But um, you know, and that 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 all kind of goes into what we've been talking about. That kind of thing of um, I think we've all heard that thing about the time passing, mm. and it's the idea of not having that goal, like not saying what you're saying, like being you know, having actions to kind of do what you do. Exactly. And that's the thing, Derek, like even when you're speaking about breakups, like, you know, I was affected by my breakup ending, but my grief for the dogs just absolutely bypassed it and overtook. I never processed, you know, up until in the last year, you know, anything got to do with the breakup. So, you know, that's when I did my grief recovery work, my own personal work on that breakup. And, you know, that's three years later, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, if I hadn't have done that work, I would be in fear of carrying on, you know, patterns and painful, you know, triggers and stuff like that into new relationships. So there is such benefit. I mean, the grief recovery work is just, it's endless on how much you can do to help yourself in different kinds of relationships in your life, whether that's a breakup, whether that's a relative that, you know, you're no longer speaking to or a family member, that there's estrangement, like friendship breakups. There's so much, yeah. you know, there's there's ways to deliver the communications that you didn't get to deliver to that person in a healthy way, but you don't do it directly to the person. We, you do it within the work and within the program. So it's, it's unbelievable. Um, uh, so 
Do you, I, I've asked therapists this before actually, and um, I, I've often wondered, and when I found out what you do, obviously, and I wanted to uh, kind of ask the question of, do you worry about taking on other people's, you know, troubles and hardships? And because you're hearing like in this line of work, you're hearing a lot of sad stories and, uh, you know, really heavy stuff. Do you worry about kind of not being able to kind of remove yourself as you walk away from the computer or whatever it might be? Well, not particularly, I think. And I suppose what you're kind of getting at is, am I, do I feel like I'm taking on that emotional energy from from those clients, you know, through the computer? But, you know, when I, you know, I'm able to, and I've learned the skills to kind of deal with that in a certain way. And also, you know, I am an advocate for therapy. Like if, you know, when, when, and when I need to go, I can go like, you know yeah. what I mean? And if I don't look after my own mental health, how can I continue to help others? So that's kind of how I handle it, you know, on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Um. So on a, uh, something completely different then, um, what do you like to do in your spare time? So in my spare time, I love hiking. So I'm still an outdoorsy kind of girl and I am going around to different places in Ireland trying to now look, I'm not, you know, climbing Paul Patrick now or anything every day of the week, but I, I like to I like to get out there hiking, whether it's by myself or whether it's with someone, because it's kind of hard to find someone that will commit to go with you. Like, yeah, so, yeah. And sometimes if the weather is iffy, like it is kind of dangerous, obviously, to hike alone, but... I do that. I also do road cycling. So I like to kind of sign up to the sportifs in Ireland, like, you know, the Riga Clare or the Clips and Motorcycle, those kinds of ones. And I like to do a few of those in the year. That's kind of, you know, that's my main hobbies. Um, travel. I like to kind of travel, like to go on a bit of a foreign holiday, maybe hot kind of places. And I'd like to kind of do some city breaks as well. So that's kind of what I do in my spare time. Fair play. And when it, when it comes to the cycling thing, because the hiking seems to be really like becoming more and more popular. Like every time, well, not every time, but less, the last few times I've, I've talked to people about, about you know, what they'd like to do in spare time. Hiking's kind of come up a, a number of times and mm. something that I haven't done, but maybe um, someday. Uh, but with with this, the road cycling then, for instance, like are you one of the cyclists that are out in the middle of the road stopping everybody from driving or are you not? Hey, I, by the way, by the way, I don't drive. So you're not in my way. So it's fine. I, I actually cycle. But is it is it the kind of the liker gear, the groups, you know, out there like yeah. proper I think, cycling? I think it's I think it's kind of the groups because how I learned how to cycle was the zero to 60 kind of thing. Like I did a little course and everything because I like, I just like learning how to do something properly yeah. from, from an expert. So that's kind of what I did. And I learned how to fix the change the tire. And we went, you know, as in I learned everything from scratch, got the bike to the bike to work scheme and everything else. And, you know, when you're in the groups, you know, generally the rule is, if you hear a car coming behind you, if if you're too abreast, I say it's yeah. cycling, that you all line up into single file to give the cars a chance to pass. But yeah. I am definitely an advocate for singling up to let car. I am a driver. So, I mean, I, I know what it feels like, but there's some, some cyclists do have rules of their own. So I do yeah. like to abide by the rules, but I mean, look, they're not in law, but they're just, no, the it's, ones I've learned. Like, ma it's car. manners really, but I like, you know, it's, it, it's fun. Like I said, I don't cycle. All right. Sorry, I don't try it. So I do cycle, but, I'm, you know, I'm not in a, you know, uh, groups or anything like that. So obviously in and out of the way. But, you know, I do think that cyclists get a kind of a bit of a rough time sometimes. And I, I think it's because of the people who don't move in. <laughs> because I. Well, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's a bit like, well, it's also because of the people. This really annoys me, actually. It's the people who break the red lights. Like, even if there's no one coming or, you oh, know, like, you know, it I just know. drives me mad. Like, it's just like, wait a minute. But I think. I would be like yourself, like I'd follow the rules and, you know, stop at red lights and make sure I, I know what I'm doing and not be in the way of cars and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I kind of joke about the, the lads, you know, if there's literally two people, you'd see it out in my road because it's quite a road, like it's just two people. It doesn't, take, together. Much. It doesn't no. take much for to move in, you know, single file, you know, and I'm not part of the cycling club. I only cycle with my friends, you know, I'm not. 
you know, part of the big lycra club. Dis- distance yourself. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah. So I'm a more of a social, like, right. you know, I could, I did a 120 kilometer cycle, ended up That's doing cool. that on my own last year. But like, I'm, I just love it because it, it helps it helps me mentally to stay strong. Yeah. So just to push myself and motivate myself. And like, I wouldn't call myself super fit, but when I train for something like that, it's such an achievement, but it's, it's just not a competition to me. It's more, it's just yeah. enjoyable. So I just love it. And yeah. So I don't know. That's oh. kind of the thing you're into as well. Yeah. I get the, you know, I get the whole thing about it not being a competition, like, you know, I, I, like, and, and then some people will do the whole thing of like, oh, it's a competition with yourself. Then it's like, no, it's not. It's just, it just take the word competition out. I've never been competitive. I don't care about it. But I just like the the mental toughness side of things, which I'm really interested in. And and you know, yeah. um, the idea of of pushing myself, like the 120 kilometers. Like, what was that for a charity or anything, or just for the crack? Like that was the Ring of Clare oh, um, okay. cycle. It's called the Ring of Clare cycle. It's on each year. Um. I just, because I'm from Ennis, it starts in Ennis and I just go ahead and do that. And I was supposed to do it with two other people, but they couldn't make it last year. So I was like, oh, well, I'm just going to do it now because I train for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that so that is, to- that that's kind of, that's where the mental toughness comes in mm. even more sometimes than the actual cycle of the easy option then you've have you've been given the the lifeline of not being having having to do it like because two people have said we're well, not going to do it well I'm not going to do it either it's their fault like yeah. that's you know what I mean like and that's where the mental toughness comes in like and what we kind of I guess what we learn from our experiences our past and and you know all talking about what you went through when you were young and gone through therapy and things like that. No, people wouldn't go and cycle 120 kilometers. Most people in the world wouldn't go and cycle 120 kilometers. Do you know what I mean? It's like but. Like sometimes it, I'll do something, but it'll take, but until I realize it's something important or an achievement, it takes somebody else to say it to me. Yeah. And I would like that to change at some point, you know, because I'm like 40. I'd like to kind of turn around at like when I'm 50 and kind of go, well, that was brilliant. And I did it myself and I don't need anyone to tell me it was great. You know what I mean? It's like. Exactly, because why can't we be our own biggest fan? Why can't we be yeah. our own biggest cheerleaders? We should, like, I mean, it takes a lot of mental toughness, like you said, and the average person wouldn't even dream of it, doing it on their own, without motivation of others and so on. But, I mean, like, it is a huge achievement, and just having the awareness and bringing the awareness to the, you know, front of your focus is just so empowering, like, it's great. I I, I, I agree fully, and, like, I know what you're saying about a lot of people say that as well, though, and this kind of was part of it, of you saying, like, I'm I'm not the fittest, but like there's a certain amount of fitness there if you're doing that kind of stuff, you know, and, and like hiking is a tough thing to do. It's not like just going for a walk down the road, you know, Um, but maybe like you needed me to tell you that. I don't know. But like, so you maybe, know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't have never considered myself like fit as a fiddle or fit, like, you know, but, but if, I, if I train for something, you know, I'm not training all year round. Like I don't train. Yeah. All year round. So I mean, I have a set goal. I'll train for like three months before a big cycle. You know, really, really consistently. But I mean, I don't find that I can, you know, maintain that all year round because I want to enjoy my life. You know, I have other yeah. goals and and so on and so forth. But it's I know I can do that, so that's great. You know, I'll do it again next year or whatever else. You know. But so. you know, you know yourself, like with fitness, like it's something subjective. Really, it's like. Like, you know, people can train every day. People can train three times a week. People can train once a week and kill you at every event. You know what I mean? It's there's there's so many different ways and, you know, and um, that's just the physical side of it. That is not even the mental side of it. You know, you you have people some train in a gym, but then if you, you know, something like a 120 kilometer cycle, they wouldn't, you know, get to 20 kilometers on it. So it's. And people have different motivations for exercise. Yeah. My motivation is it helps my mental health. Yeah. Like I walk for an hour every day in my lunch. I I need that. Like that's good for my mental health. It takes me away from work. You know, that's this kind of thing. So I mean, other people have more competitive or mm-hmm. you know fitness goals, and every so often, like it's completely individual. I suppose, as you know yourself, like you're you're in the fitness game, but like it's it's just it's just so beneficial, even for even for grief. Even for grief, like, you know, when you're, 
when you're thinking of it in a in a healthy way that you're not like what I did was just excessively and not not like wanting to think about my painful emotions but now like I can incorporate it in a healthy way into my life so I'm not kind of revert back to that pattern absolutely yeah uh, you just reminded me I didn't read out the advert but it's all right it's only oh. one, it's only one, it's only one week they'll be all right and um, it's not going to fall apart the place um where can people find you so I suppose the fastest way is Instagram um underscore light after loss um I share lots of helpful kind of information over there and I have an upcoming pet loss online support group starting next week if anybody's interested, all the details are there or else people can contact me through my website. It is lightafterloss.ie. Excellent. We will uh, we will tag that and do all that stuff. And uh, I know I told you it'd be a couple of weeks before it comes on, but actually it'll be, it'll be next week. I don't know why I'm saying that live on the, the people listening on the podcast go, it's next week. You're talking about it right now. But anyway, regardless of that. But Louise, um, you've been a, a brilliant guest um, and thank you very much for for. Uh, teaching me about all things grief and uh i need to stop i was going to say dogs again but like yeah, i need to just stop about the animals uh but uh you've been great thank you very much for uh for coming on thanks Derek. it's been a pleasure thanks so much uh stick around for a minute if you wouldn't mind and i'll close this out and we'll get it we'll get a photo I'd have a few more thank yous to do um thank you very much to john for uh his tech stuff uh, thanks to my mom and dad my granddad Jared and Calvin for the music and the logo uh, we're on YouTube subscribe if you would Instagram Facebook Twitter kind of uh, Spotify Apple Anchor Google Podcasts are the uh, podcast platforms there's some other ones as well um, very vague and uh, obviously thanks very much uh, everyone for watching and for listening and all that and once again Louise thanks a lot thanks alright everyone see you next week take care bye